Today we're in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, and we're going to be telling you about the very best Sony gear for shooting wildlife photography that includes bodies, lenses, and teleconverters. So whether you already have your Sony camera or you're looking for a new camera to shoot wildlife, this is the video for you. We're going to walk you through your best choices, but also give you tips about how to get the most out of your gear in case you already own it. This video is sponsored by Professional Photographers of America. Join a community of over 30,000 photographers that includes equipment insurance, education, and business tools made specifically for small business owners like you. First, Chelsea and I are going to talk about the merits of each of the different Sony bodies. After that, we'll talk about the lenses and teleconverters that you might use to get the best images out of each. First, I'm going to cover the Sony APS-C bodies like the A6400 and the A6600. These bodies have a smaller sensor than the Sony full frame cameras and still 24 megapixels. That means the pixels are packed more tightly in the center, giving you a higher pixel density. That's a very nerdy way of saying your pictures are going to be sharper and you're going to get a little bit more reach out of your telephoto lenses. And if you're new to wildlife photography, you might not realize it's really hard to get close enough to animals to actually fill the frame. So that little bit of reach really helps out a lot. Sony has two camera lineups. Their APS-C cameras with four digits in the name and their full frame cameras with one digit. They both have the same lens mount, but the sensor sizes are different. Normally, the smaller sensors of the APS-C cameras are a disadvantage, but wildlife is different because you almost always need to crop. After cropping, a 24 megapixel APS-C camera will have twice as many megapixels as a 24 megapixel full frame camera like the more expensive A7 III. That's why we love APS-C cameras for wildlife. The APS-C bodies are generally gonna produce better images than the full frame cameras will, making these smaller bodies perfect for wildlife photography. They're not all created equal though. The latest generation of Sony APS-C bodies have a much better focusing system, especially when dealing with big telephoto lenses at the long end of the lenses. So if you have a choice, pick an A6400 or an A6600. That's gonna make your life a lot easier than if you're shooting with say an older body like an A6000. Now people can get great wildlife images with those, but it's gonna be a lot more challenging. And for me personally, I like the challenge of wildlife photography to be more in capturing the image of the animals and getting the lighting right than in dealing with frustrating focusing systems. Some best practices with these bodies. Use the high frame rate, but not the high plus frame rate, at least when you're shooting fast moving subjects like flying birds. The reason for this is, while it slows the shutter down, it gives you a more real-time view through the viewfinder, and that means you'll be better able to track moving subjects. Now, if it's a perfectly still subject, feel free to go to high plus if you really want to be able to capture that split-second moment. When selecting a focusing mode on these newer bodies, I would suggest using the tracking center mode for most wildlife photography subjects. That will lock onto a subject and follow it as you move around the frame, and that just makes it easier to keep in the frame. If you are using a zoom lens, start by zooming back, getting your subject lock on, and then once it's locked on, go ahead and zoom in. If it's a still subject, you'll find AFS mode is more accurate and reliable. But if it's a moving subject, you should switch to AFC. Something about these APS-C bodies is it's all very small, and that can make it a little bit challenging, especially with bigger lenses. This Tamron 150-500 handles pretty well. But for bigger lenses like the Sony 200-600, I definitely like to have a vertical grip on there. That also extends the battery life some, which means for a longer outing in the field, you won't run out of batteries, batteries nearly as fast. Now, these cameras have either a silent shutter or a mechanical shutter. The silent shutter is going to be your better choice for times when you can get really close to the subjects and you don't want to disturb them. However, that silent shutter can contribute to what we call rolling shutter, where moving subjects might appear diagonal, especially fast moving subjects. And in those cases, like a flying bird, you'll want to switch to the mechanical shutter mode, which will make some noise, but it will give you overall better image quality. We've done extensive testing both with and without teleconverters to determine the setup that gives you the best image quality. With these APS-C bodies, you basically have a teleconverter built in since it has that 1.5 crop. Thus, we didn't get better image quality out of any of the combinations by adding a teleconverter. You're better off just cropping in post if you need to get a little closer. The teleconverter slows you down, but doesn't give you sharper images. 
that recommendation will change for some of these other bodies. One thing about finding your perfect wildlife setup is that you want to make sure you have gear insurance. I've seen so many people break their expensive lenses and cameras. PPA protects more than your gear. If you have a hard drive failure, their data loss recovery program can retrieve your files for a small deductible. They can even cover your legal fees if you have an unhappy client. I hope I never have to use it, but I sleep easier knowing the PPA Indemnification Trust has me protected if something does go wrong. PPA has you covered. If you want to sign up for their gear insurance and their educational benefits, their contracts, and all the other things you get when you get PPA, go down into the description down below and we have a coupon down there and the link to their site. Thanks PPA. This is the Sony a7 III. It's $2,000 and this is a full frame camera. Uh, pretty much everything applies to this that Tony was talking about with the a6400. But because it's full frame, you're gonna get a wider angle of view when you're shooting, which means you'll see more of the scene. That can make it easier to track your subjects. That being said, if you don't completely fill the frame with your subject, you can end up getting less detail when you crop with this full frame camera than you do with the a6400 APS-C uh, sensor. It's 24 megapixels. You get 10 frames per second and the autofocusing is pretty good but it's not as sophisticated as the newer Sony's. They have real-time tracking in their autofocusing meaning that they track the subject more effectively but you can still make do with this. It still works well. It does have two card slots, which is nice if you like shooting JPEG plus RAW like I do and then writing to both cards. But keep in mind, if you're shooting RAW, you're going to fill your buffer much faster and that can sometimes be an issue. So let's try to fill this buffer when shooting in RAW and see what that's like. You can see how it slows down because it's writing to the memory card. Um, I thought that was plenty of shots. I usually compensate by just kind of shooting in bursts so that I'm not filling the buffer as quickly, but it's something you'll want to keep in mind and then manage. If you want to put a teleconverter on this, you can put a 1.4 times teleconverter and get more reach. And if your subject is still, you can get a lot of detail. But keep in mind, if you're tracking a moving subject, the autofocus is not as good with the teleconverter on. So slow moving or still subjects, you'll get more detail, but anything moving really quickly will be a big challenge. If you wanna use a teleconverter, you also have to make sure it's compatible with your lens. So it should be fine on any Sony lenses, but this Tamron, for example, is not compatible with the teleconverter, so you wouldn't be able to use it. If you have a few more bucks to spend, you might be looking at a Sony a7R 3 a7R 4 A9, A9 II, or the big boy, the Sony Alpha 1. You can get great results with any of those cameras, but they all have their own advantages and disadvantages. The Sony a7R 3 and a7R 4 have really high megapixel sensors with no anti-aliasing filter. And that means you don't have to use a teleconverter. You can crop and post, but still get that wide field of view. And it means you can get just like ridiculously detailed images, which I just love to do. Unfortunately, they have some like big drawbacks. The autofocusing systems on both those cameras, they aren't great at long telephoto distances. Up close, they're fine, but especially tracking moving birds, it's, it's just gonna make things a little more challenging for you. They also have a silent shutter mode, which is so useful for wildlife photography, and you can use that for still subjects. But if it's a moving subject, that silent shutter mode is gonna introduce some really serious rolling shutter effects. So on either of those bodies, if you are using them, be sure to use the mechanical shutter just whenever possible. And uh, on the lens, use the focusing limiter whenever possible to limit the focusing range either up close or far away, just so that the focusing system doesn't have to hunt quite as much. A step better than the two R bodies are the Sony A9 bodies. They're, the Sony A9 and A9 II, they're pretty much the same, so you might as well get the less expensive one. They both offer you a full 20 frames per second with no viewfinder blackout. And for capturing fast-moving subjects and sort of showing uh, sequences and capturing that ultimate moment when, say, the bird pulls the fish out of the water, that is so powerful but they have a serious drawback. They only have 24 megapixel sensors and they have really heavy AA filters on them. So the image quality is gonna be very similar to the Sony a7 III that Chelsea was talking about. It's just, it's capturing more frames per second. All of these cameras have some amount of viewfinder lag, especially when you're shooting. When you're looking through it, you're looking at an electronic screen here. And because it takes some time to process it and display it to you, 
you're always seeing things a little bit in the past. Now those APS-C bodies have kind of a lot of viewfinder lag and so do the A7R 3 and 4. The A9 doesn't have a lot of viewfinder lag so it's pretty good for tracking moving subjects except when you start to push the shutter and you're shooting at 20 frames per second then it can actually slow down and introduce a significant amount of lag. In those scenarios be sure that you shoot a little bit ahead of the subject. There is a camera that addresses all of these concerns and gives you the ultimate autofocusing system and a crazy 30 frames per second. So you can be capturing 50 megapixel stills at the speed of video. And for wildlife, it's really revolutionary. And it's why I've chosen that as my wildlife body. It's the Sony Alpha 1, their flagship camera. And the EVAF flag is better. It has that high megapixel sensor, but none of the limitations of the weaker focusing systems but it has one really, really big drawback, and that is a $6,500 price tag. It is crazy expensive. If you're really serious about wildlife, it is the camera to get because it's really the first camera that gives us everything we want with absolutely no compromises. So with those suggestions and tips, we'll move on to talking about the best lenses to get. If you're shooting with one of the APS-C cameras, like a Sony A6600, you'll probably want to start wildlife photography with Sony's 70-350 to lens. At $1,000, it's really versatile. You can use it for sports too, and as long as you can get close enough to subjects, it's going to give you good results. But there is an option for only $1,300 that's a lot better and will give you much sharper images. Your next step up will be the 150 to 500 Tamron lens. Um, it's an f5.6 to 6.7 and it's sharper, it's got fast autofocus. You can use it on a full frame sensor or APS-C and it's going to work well. A step up from that is the $2,000 Sony 200 to 600, the lens I'm using here. And it's bigger and heavier, so you're not going to have a great time hiking with it, even though it's not that bad. It also has the internal zoom, so it's not getting longer and shorter, which just generally makes the handling better. We found that it does produce noticeably sharper images than the Tamron 150 to 500, mostly I think because it has that extra 100 millimeters of reach, which means for those faraway subjects, you don't have to crop as much. I absolutely love the lens. The one disadvantage that I found is when you're working up close to small animals, like you can finally get really close to a small bird, the focus breathing means that the 600 millimeters shrinks close to about 300 millimeters. You can totally resolve this by putting on a couple of extension tubes. I like to use about 36 millimeters of extension on this, and that brings it back close to a full 600 millimeters. Basically, if I know I'm going to be getting close to animals, I'll put the extension tubes on ahead of time. This has been a great setup, but there is one lens above this, and it's the 13 thousand dollar Sony 600 millimeter f4 and if you are a very serious wildlife photographer with a twenty thousand dollar budget the Sony 600 f4 with the Sony Alpha 1 is really the very best combination you can get on that combination I would definitely use a 1.4 or 2 times teleconverter to get even closer to faraway subjects because that lens is so sharp, it can handle the extra teleconverters, whereas these zooms, you really don't see much difference in detail, at least on the higher megapixel bodies. I do want to talk about the possibility of adapting Canon wildlife lenses to Sony, because I know a lot of people are doing this. The way we'd recommend doing this is using the Sigma MC11 adapter. And this gives you full control of autofocus, image stabilization, and uh, aperture control but it slows things down a little bit. The focusing won't be quite as good as you would get if you were using a native Sony lens or a native Canon body on your lens. Still, it does work. It just makes things a little bit more challenging. You know what I mean? So if you have the opportunity, I would definitely consider upgrading to a native Sony lens to get the best results. I hope we've been able to help you figure out which Sony gear you should use and to get the most out of the Sony gear you already have. If you want to see more videos about wildlife or just photography in general, please subscribe using the button down below and leave a comment if you have any questions. And thanks Professional Photographers of America for sponsoring this video.